So uh, today I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Joshua Lee from our own UCR. Uh, Joshua um, uh, got his PhD at Columbia University in 2011 uh, before going to MIT for a postdoc. And then he came to UCR in uh, 2015. Uh, um, and his group investigates novel quantum phenomena in uh, two-dimensional materials and heterostructures using uh, optical spectroscopy and combining that with nanofabrication. Uh, so uh, he's built a very successful group here at UCR and was awarded the NSF Career Award in 2020. And he's going today to talk, us, talk to us about his current research. So Joshua, you can go ahead, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you uh, see my screen? Okay, very yeah, good. Yeah, we okay, so um, uh, it's my pleasure. Okay, we will talk about um, how we study the novel excitonic state and electronic phases in two-dimensional semiconductors and Mauritian lattices by using optical spectroscopy combined with nanofabrication. Okay, to begin with, uh, let me introduce uh, 2D materials to you. Uh, 2D material has been a, a very uh, um, uh, on graphene and in recent years uh, people... joshua you're cutting out um sometimes um cutting out yeah is your connection good uh let me try to close the other program i think that that can probably help um so how about now is it better maybe i can stop my video would that improve the improve? Yeah, I think that's better. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, so good. Uh, okay, so, uh, but in recent years, people moved to uh, study uh, semiconducting uh, two-dimensional materials and also they had structures and more super lattices. So in the past few years, uh, we study uh, the two-dimensional materials of, of transition metal dichalcogenite. One example of uh, transition metal dichalcogenide is uh, tungsten diselenide, uh, WSE2. So this material has um, a, two, a layer structure as shown here. Uh, so all the atoms within one layer, they're strongly bonded with each other, but the layers are coupled weakly by when the wall forces with each other. So the crystal is, uh, is, is like this. And then if you use a scotch tape to exfoliate it, you, you can peel off just one or two layers from the crystal. So you can have a monolayer or bilayer uh, semiconducting material system. So once you peel off one layer, uh, the band structure of this uh, monolayer become actually very different from the bulk. So in monolayer WSE2, the band structure can be simplified in this way. And uh, you can, uh, if you only consider the electronic states near the band gap. So then there are, there are two inequivalent values called K and K prime values in the hexagonal brilliant zone of the material. Then uh, in each valley, there's a direct band gap. And these two valleys are connected to each other by time reversal symmetry. Uh, so the spin configurations are opposite from each other. And then these two, this two values they are coupled to light of opposite polarization, opposite circular polarization. If you shine red right-handed circularly polarized light, you excite the electron in one valley. If you shine a left-handed circular, circularly polarized light, then you excite the electrons in another valley. So you can have optically controllable valleys in this system. So they can find some applications in this field called 
Valleytronic. Huh? Valleytronic means you use the valley as the information carrier to transmit information. And also, there's another interesting property about 2D semiconductor is that the interaction between the carriers in the 2D semiconductors are, are very strong. Huh? So if you solve a hydrogen atom in two dimension, you'll find that the binding energy is four times of that in three dimension. Huh? This is because when you can find the electrons in, in lower dimension, then the electrons and holes, they have higher chance to meet each other. So the interaction is enhanced. So because the interaction is stronger, so the electrons and holes in the material, they, they, they interact strongly with each other. They can form excitons with, with, with high binding energy. Uh, so the binding energy can be higher than 100 million EV. So it is important even at room temperature. And they can also form higher order correlated states. For example, a uh, trion, which is the analog of a uh, hydrogen ion. And the binding energy of a trion can be larger than 10 million EV. So it is important uh, for this material. So in this talk, I will go through some uh, some uh, research results that we have obtained at, at UC Riverside. Uh, so we'll, I would first talk about the ripple exciton states, uh, including the ground and excited state excitons. Then we'll talk about dark excitons and dark trions in this material. Then we'll go to uh, bilayer. Uh, we'll find in bilayer, there are some special type of excitons with vertical uh, dipole. And we can use the vertical electric field to tune their properties. Then at the end, I will talk about some novel correlated states in, uh, in uh, Moray super lattices of the 2D materials. So let's first talk about uh, exciton ripple states. Yeah. We all know the hydrogen atom, they can host the ripple states. You have the 1s, 2s, 3s states. And then they, their energy, uh, the energy levels follow the ripple formula. Uh, so different level. Uh, when you have the transition between different levels, they will give you this so-called the, the ripple spectrum, okay? And then in semiconductors, the electrons and holes, uh, they mimic the electron and protons for the hydrogenic atoms. So they can also form bound states and they will also show uh, some ripple-like spectrum and ripple-like states. And in our experiment, we, we fabricate a monolayer WSE2 and then we use the boron nitride crystal to encapsulate this material. And this boron nitride encapsulation will improve the, the surface quality and make, keep the sample clean uh, so that we can have a sharp spectrum. Then we shine the laser on it and excite the electron hole pairs. And then the electron hole pairs we combine to give us the photoluminescence. So one main difference between this electron hole bound state and the hydrogen bound state is that this is a two-dimensional system, but it is not exactly two-dimensional. It is a two-dimensional system embedded in a three-dimensional space. Uh, the electrons and holes, they're confined in a two-dimension, but those electric fields between them, they go out, uh, they, they go out into the three-dimensional space out of the plane. Uh, so it is a, a, a special system with two-dimensional confined carriers, but three-dimensional interactions, okay? So they will produce a, a spectrum that is very different from, from hydrogen. You can see the hydrogen levels, they're quite far apart. Uh, but when you go to 2D material, the levels are, are more evenly distributed. Okay, they're more evenly distributed. Then we, we shine the light and see the transition between these this, this different levels. Then we can observe the one air states. We can see the two air states, three years and four air states. So please know that this, 2s, 3s, 4s, they, they're multiplied by 50 times here. So they're much weaker, they're much weaker. So we need a clean sample to see them. So after that, we can know the relative position of these levels. Not only so, we can use them to estimate the band gap. We just plot all the energy of this 1s, 2s, 3s state. Then we find that the approach, they approach a certain limit and that is the band gap of the material. And then from the band gap, and then we can get the binding energy for different levels, okay? And another thing that we can do is to measure the exciton size. Uh, we know that when the exciton go from ground state to the excited state, they get bigger and bigger. Uh, but exactly how big they are, we, we can measure it. 
So we can do this by measuring the exciton spectrum and the electric uh, and the magnetic field. So this is a map of the um, the second derivative of PR because these features are weak. So we do the second derivative to uh, sharpen the weak feature, and we measure the PR at different. Uh, magnetic field from negative 31 to positive 31 uh, Tesla. So we find some linear shifts. So this linear shift are due to the Zeeman shift. Huh? So from there, we can, we can get the Zeeman G factor, but we're more interested in the diamagnetic shift. You can see that as you go from higher excited states, not besides the linear shift, huh, we also see the, the quadratic shift. Huh? So from the quadratic shift, we can find uh, this, uh, this coefficient, the sigma. So this coefficient sigma is proportional to the exciton radius square. Uh, that is proportional to the, the size of the exciton. So from the curvature, we can deduce the size of the, the exciton. So this is the exciton radius at different state, 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s. You, I mean, we plot this in log scale. So you, you can see that the exciton radius goes from uh, about one point something nanometer to a few nanometer to more than 10 nanometer, more than 20, 10 nanometer. So the exciton get, get bigger and bigger. Uh, so this figure, uh, I'll show you graphically how big the excitons are. This is the 1S day, 2S day, 3S, 4S. Uh, I draw this in a, a realistic proportion. Uh, so you can see that the exciton get, get actually quite big in this material. And this is also a realistic uh, uh, spectrum, like how, how, how much they're separated from each other. So it's actually quite different from the, from the hydrogen spectrum. Uh, so this is because this is a, a 2D system embedded in a three-dimensional three space. Uh, so this is the first part of my talk that we have studied uh, the ribbon excitons in monolayer semiconductors. So let's go to the second part. Uh, there are some, interesting excitonic states in uh, 2D semiconductors. One of those interesting states are the dark excitons and dark trions. Uh, so to begin with, let me introduce what is bright exciton and what is dark exciton. So this material has two valleys, the K and K prime valleys. So for each valley, there are two conduction bands and two valence bands, and they have opposite spin. Uh, each, each of these subbands, they have opposite spin configuration. So let's focus on just one valley. Uh, so just we mainly focus on the top valence band uh, because the bottom valence band is a uh, uh, much lower, a uh, much higher in energy. Okay. So if you excite the electron hole pair, uh, you will excite one electron from spin up to also the spin up state. Of course, they can recombine to give you the light. So this exciton, when they emit the light. Uh, the light has uh, some special uh, optical selection rule. Uh, the emitted light will be out of plane, and then we'll have a certain uh, circularly polarized uh, polarization, circular polarization. So we call, it, we call this the bright exciton. If we have one extra charge, then the exciton can couple to this charge to form a new correlated state with three particles. Uh, we call this the bright trion, uh, the bright trion. Uh, the emission property of the, the trion is similar to the bright exciton. Okay, so besides this bright state, there's also a dark state. Uh, if you consider this valley, if you form an electron, a whole pair, uh, let's say this electron is excited, then this electron can relax to the lower to the lower uh, valley, and then you can form you can form a, a dark exciton. Of course, the relaxation requires some some mechanism to flip the spin. Uh, and, and in this system, there's some spin orbit coupling, uh, which can help, help us to do it. Okay, so this dark exciton has a very different property from the bright. Hey, hey Josh, Josh, what's the difference between bright and dark exitons again? Uh, bright and dark is mainly on the oscillator strings. Bright means the oscillator string is strong. You can see the absorption. And you, of course, the emission is also String is okay. weak, very small. So this oscillator string is about to all. You know the photon cannot really flip the spin of the electron, right? So so when you have, when you have the opposite spin, they they cannot be coupled by photon. 
And in this, in the material, there are some uh, spin orbit coupling, which, which would would relax the selection rule, but still the oscillator string is much weaker. Uh, however, for the dark exciton, it has a lower energy. So the carrier tend to relax to the lowest band. So you will have the string. So eventually we actually, we can see the, the signal from the dark exciton because of its high population. And the, the dark exciton, the emission is very different. It emits light in the in direction. And the uh, emission has linear polarization. When you have one more charge, then, then you have Yes. So yes. we can have a comparison between dark and bright states. For the bright exciton and trion, the spin has a singular uh, configuration. Uh, it has a, a relatively strong uh, oscillator strength. The emission direction is out of plane. Of course, when you emit, it would, it would diverge. Uh, but the general direction is out of plane. And the lifetime is short uh, because of the, uh, it's in high energy and also the oscillator strength and, and, and um, and uh, I mean, all this contribute to the lifetime and the lifetime is less than 10 picosecond, it's short lived. For the dark exciton and trion, it has a triplet state with a weak oscillator strength. And then uh, the emission lies in, in plane direction and uh, the, the lifetime is longer, it's higher than uh, 100 picosecond. Uh, so they're very different. So we have studied uh, the dark excitons in this uh, sample. So usually it's quite difficult to measure them because the light emits in the in-plane direction. However, the light will, will diverge. Uh, so if we use a high, high angle objective, we can, we can collect some of the light from the dark exciton and then we can measure the signal. So we have fabricated um, a broad nitride encapsulated monolayer WSE2 devices. Uh, we use broad nitride to encapsulate WSE2 and then we use a, a, a piece of thin graphite as an electrode. Uh, this will improve the contact and uh, enhance the device performance. And then we use another graphite below BN. So this semiconductor and the graphite, they will form a capacitor. They will form a capacitor. When we apply the voltage between them, we can inject the electron or take away the electron from the sample so that we can tune the Fermi level. And this is the optical picture of one of the devices. Uh, you can see different layers and the sample is, is in the middle. Uh, this is the sample. So we measure the photoluminescence at different gate voltage. Uh, so near the middle here, this is at the charge neutrality point. And then, and then uh, on the lower half here, this is uh, when the sample has a, a hole injection that like you take away the electrons. And then on the, on the top part, you have the electron side. That means you, you inject electron into the system. So in the high energy side, we have the bright exciton. We call it the A0, A exciton. Then when you inject electron, you have the bright trion. There are two of them, inter-valley and intra valleys And then on the lower side, you have the bright trion on the whole side. So the binding energy of these, these trions is, a, is from 21 to 29 milliEV. Then here, there's a weak peak here. There's a weak peak. This is the dark exciton. Uh, it is about 41 milliEV below the bright exciton. And then when you, when you inject electrons or holes into the system, you have the dark trions and the dark, uh, the tri dark trions on the, in the electron side and the, on the whole side. And the binding energy is, is uh, four, 14 to 16 milliEV, uh, which is smaller than the binding energy of the bright, the bright trions. So how can we prove that this is dark trion? Huh? We need to prove it. How can we prove it? So there are some evidence. So for example, you have the bright trion in high energy, the dark trion in lower energy. If the temperature is high, then both of them will have uh, some population, okay? However, if you lower the temperature, then the bright trion will lose population and the dark trion will gain the population because these carriers will go to the lower energy level when you lower the temperature. So correspondingly, when we measure the spectrum at lower and lower temperature, they get stronger and stronger. This is the dark trion. Okay, so when we plot the intensity as a function of uh, temperature, you see that the, the bright they get weaker 
and then the dark state gets stronger as you uh, decrease the temperature. Huh? So this is one evidence to show that they are the dark states. There's another uh, evidence that is to measure the Zeeman G factor. So these are the two values, the color represent the spin. Uh, so this is one trion. Uh, this is the bright trion uh, with the spin uh, single -like configuration. If you apply the magnetic field, then this different band, they will shift. They will shift. I mean, the different contributions to the Zeeman shift. Uh, so overall, if you consider all of them, the G factor is negative four. Okay, but for the, the dark trion, it has opposite spin. Uh, so the shifting will be different. Uh, if you calculate the G factor here, it is larger. The G factor is negative eight. It's about twice of that of the bright state. Uh, so this is the theoretical prediction based on the simple model. So in our experiment, we can show it. But before we go there, let's, let me talk about a third signature. That is the optical selection rules. emit light with circular polarization. Uh, uh, so this K value can emit light with the right-handed light. Uh, the K prime value emit left-handed light. But for the dark exciton and trion, they, they emit linearly polarized light. So that means if you only measure the emission with left-handed polarization, for bright state, you only see one value. But for the dark state, you see both value because the, the values for the dark state, they emit linearly polarized light. So for left-handed collection, you see both values. Uh, so this is another signature. Okay, so we have measured the left-handed PL of the exciton as a different uh, magnetic field, okay? So here you see the bright trion, uh, the bright trion, there the are two of them. Uh, so the slope, from the slope, you can get the G factor, which is about negative four, okay? And you see, the, 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 the slope here is showing only one value. And on the lower energy, you see the dark trion, you see two values. Uh, one goes up, the other goes down, you see a cross. Uh, that means you see two values according to the value selection rules. And then also you can see that the slope is, is larger. From the slope is larger than the bright trion. So from the slope, you can get a G factor of about negative nine. Uh, so, so both confer, uh, observation confirm our prediction on the property of the bright and the dark trions. Another signature is the lifetime. So we have measured the lifetime of the, the trions. So this is the instrument response. So our instrument has a resolution of about 20 picosecond. Okay, we measure the bright trion. You see that the, the, the lifetime is quite short, uh, comparable to the, to the resolution of the, the instrument. But when we, okay, we can decomp do a deconvolution to get the lifetime, which is smaller than 10 picosecond. Then for the dark trion, you can see that the lifetime is much longer. After the deconvolution, we get a lifetime of, uh, of about one nanosecond, uh, longer than one nanosecond. So it's about two orders of magnitude longer. And very interestingly, we can also tune the lifetime. Like you inject electrons or take away electrons from the system. Then you'll find that the lifetime of the dark trion can change. Uh, so we can plot the lifetime as a function of gate voltage. So you see that we can tune the lifetime from one point, one point about 1.2 nano, nanosecond all the way down to 370 picoseconds. So over a, a, factor of, a factor of three to four. Uh, so we can tune the lifetime with the gate voltage. So this dark trion uh, give us some possibility to realize trion transport. I mean, normally for the normal electronics, we use individual electrons to transmit information. But we can also use trions. Uh, for, for example, if you shine the light and generate the trions, and then you apply a voltage to generate the electric field. Uh, because the trions has a net charge, so the electric field can drive the trion from one end to the other end of the device. So you can realize trion transport. And for bright trion, uh, the main limitation is that the lifetime is very short, it's about 10 picosecond. So if you use a, a strong electric field, let's say 0.5 volt, volt per, per micrometer, and then a, a relatively high mobility 400, then you predict a drift distance is about 0.2 micro, micrometer, which is quite short. Uh, but if you use dark trion, uh, the lifetime is two orders of magnitude longer, then the predicted drift distance will be in the order of 20 micron. 
Uh, so this this make it like a practical. Uh, so this so our observation of the dark triangle open this possibility to to realize triangle transports. Hey Joshua, a quick question: What yeah. is the lifetime for this dark triangle? Is some spin intervalley scattering or is like spin strip scattering? You need some spin flip presumably or some intervalley physics. The dark right? triangle. Mm -hmm. The lifetime. Uh, uh, I think uh, the lifetime for the for the the dark trion, I mean the, the detail mechanism can be complicated because we don't know the, the defect, the contribution of the defect. But certainly the defect is 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 one uh, one factor, like the non-radiated uh, recombination, and also the I mean it, it, the, the the this dark trion is not completely dark. Because the system has spin orbit coupling, so there's some mechanism to flip the spin. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I think it's a combination of the defect assistant uh, recombination and also the optical recombination. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Joshua, so what's the advantage of uh, the down, dark triangle transport? It's still a charge transport, right? It's still a charge transport. Uh, the the main advantage is that. Uh, it can carry some uh, like additional information, like 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 a richer richer than the individual electron. Um, for example, the trion has the valley the valley information. Like you can generate trion in one valley on the other valley, so you can use it for valley it? Tonics. Oh, you can easily the... probe it because uh, um, actually uh, we have another paper to show that there is another signature of the. I mean, it has very, it has very, uh, 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 it has very index. Like you can generate a dark triangle in one valley and a dark triangle in another valley. The the signature is that it has a certain kind of a chirophone replica. Uh, when it emit one photon, is it is linearly polarized. But when it emit one photon plus one phonon, that emission can be circularly polarized. So you can use that phonon assisted emission. To, to tell the to tell the valley index. So so this can be used to realize valley tronics. That's right. And the related question. Does it have a spin structure? What is this like what is the spin of this object? It's some the dark trial? The dark trial? Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, I didn't show it here before. Mm -hmm. The the spin configuration is here, here, here. Uh, here, here. Mm -hmm. So you have a Spin down for electrons, spin up for hole, mm -hmm. and then here is spin spin up. I see. So they, they, there is no like uh, they don't form some sort of singlet uh, like higher spin state. It's just like three objects with ind individual spins. They don't like couple. Uh, I mean, this is a, just a simple picture. Yeah, but if you if you say for 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 this tool, whether they have a. a some other superposition. Yeah, yeah the three also... spinner halves, do they add up in some interesting ways? That's what I'm asking. Or are they just like product state? They can form uh, the triplet, that's three states, right? So they, they have those details, but our experiment could not reveal those details. Oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, we have another work going on uh, that is related to those details. Um, Okay, uh, any other questions before I move on? Okay, so uh, just let me quickly summarize this section that so we observe gate tunable dark excitons and trions in monolayer WSE2. Uh, the dark trions has a larger G factor and D which is two orders of magnitude longer than the, the, bright, uh, the bright state. Uh, so this work has been published in PRL about two years ago. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go to the next topic. So, so far we have talked about just uh, the excitonic state in monolayer. So what about if you have one more layer? Uh, when you have one more layer, you have some new phenomena that are quite interesting. Uh, one particular thing is that you will have a new kind of exciton with a vertical dipole. Uh, for a monolayer, the exciton are just confined in one layer. If you apply electric field, you don't produce too much effect huh, because the dipole is, is confined in one layer. But once you have two layer, uh, some of the exciton can have vertical dipole huh, and those dipoles are permanent, uh, they're there. So when you apply the electric field, you can tune the energy. 
So we have studied bilayer WSC2. And then we make And you can also inject child carriers. But here, I mainly focus on the electric field effect. So let me uh, give a quick introduction on bilayer WSC2. So when you have one more layer, you can stack the top layer uh, with a 180 degree rotation. Uh, so that this two, they have different orientation. So this, this material then will have the, uh, the spatial uh, inversion symmetry. And then the one main effect is that the interlayer coupling will cause this Q value to go down. So this is the K value. For the monolayer, the Q value is, is high. So you only need to consider the K value. But once you go to bilayer, the Q value due to the interlayer coupling will go down. And then the Q value will become the lowest conduction band. And that would actually dominate the, uh, some of the optical properties. And then there are two there are two excitons. One is the QK exciton. You have a Q electron coupled with a, a, a K hole to form a QK exciton. But you can also, this electron can also couple with a gamma, with a gamma hole to form another exciton called Q gamma. Just from this band structure, you'll find, you'll feel that oh, QK has a higher energy than Q gamma, uh, has a lower energy than Q gamma. However, once they form exciton, it will become more complicated huh? because you can see that this band, this, Q, this gamma band is flat. The effective mass is large. So once they form an exciton, the binding energy of the exciton will be larger. So it is actually uh, difficult to determine whether Q gamma has a lower energy or QK has a lower energy. Huh? So because they, you have the band structure, you also have the exciton binding energy. And then, once you apply the electric field, uh, so each of this band here, they are twofold degenerates. Once you apply the electric field to break the inversion symmetry, then each of this band here will be, will be lifted. The degeneracy will be lifted. Uh, but for the gamma, the gamma is protected uh, by, the time, uh, by the time inversion symmetry. So it is still degenerates. Uh, so you expect that all this, all this uh, uh, exciton, they will, they will be lifted, right? they will split. Uh, and then we have measured uh, the, the photoluminescence at different electric fields. So this is the photoluminescence and this is the gate voltage difference between top gate and bottom gate. So you, you can just take this as the electric field. Uh, then we see some cross shape, uh, this X shape feature. Uh, this is Q gamma, uh, this is Q gamma, but this is QK. Uh, this is QK. And all this uh, bright state, bright emission here, they're phonon replicas. I mean, they're stronger because this excitons, they're momentum in direct exciton. Uh, so you need the defect to help, help them to recombine. So when you have the phonon to assist them, the actual the emission actually is actually stronger. Uh, so when we do the second derivative, uh, we can uh, enhance this weak feature. So this, this is the second derivative of, of this map. So you can see the Q gamma exciton and QK exciton. So one interesting thing is that Q gamma actually has lower energy than QK. Uh, this is not what you expect from the band structure. From the band structure, QK has a lower separation. Q gamma has a high, larger separation. But our results show that Q gamma has lower energy. That means this larger effective mass and also the, 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 the large excitonic binding energy is very important to determine the, the energy order. So we have analyzed the data and uh, this is a, uh, a, a first principle calculation uh, on, the, on the density of the electron. So this is the density as a function of vertical distance. So for the Q exciton, uh, this is spin up and spin down is very much uh, just spin up polarized. Uh, so you can see that they're distributed unevenly between the two layers. For the K-hole, it is very much layer polarized. They are localized in one layer. But for the gamma, then uh, it's evenly distributed between the two layers. So when you form the QK exciton, you have the Q electron, and you have the K-hole, then they will produce a, a certain dipole. It's relatively large, the dipole is large. But once you form a Q gamma, the, the gamma hole is evenly distributed between the two layers with no dipole. So the, the total dipole of the Q gamma exciton is small. 
So one, one excitement has a large dipole, the other has a small dipole. Once you apply the electric field, they will show different stock shifts. So you can see the QK. Relatively small stock shifts. Then there's one interesting thing that is at a certain electric field, you can switch their order. At zero electric field, Q gamma is lower than QK. So this Q gamma can dominate the PL. But once you tune up the electric field, QK will become low in energy. And Q gamma will become weaker, and then QK will become stronger. So you can actually use the electric field to switch uh, the two elect the excitons and make one the dominate. And then you can also make the other the dominate. So you can achieve a switchable dominant exciton in the bilayer system. So uh, let me give us a, a, a quick summary. So we have a study bilayer WSE2 and the exhibit two, uh, two exciton, uh, QK and Q, Q gamma intervalley excitons. And these two excitons have different uh, uh, interlayer dipole and different star shift. And we can use the outer plane electric field to tune their relative energy position and determine which one is the dominant one uh, for the luminescence. And then so far, we have only talked about uh, uh, monolayer or bilayer with good stacking order. Yeah. But when you have two layers, you can actually rotate them, twist them. And this will produce a Mori pattern. Huh? So this animation shows that when you have two, two monolayer, if you rotate them at different angle, then their superposition will, will, can show some uh, uh, Mori pattern. Huh? This is what you see, like a nanoscale periodic modulation on the crystal. So this, this Mori pattern will consider one example. This is WSE2 and MOSE2 heterobilayer. So this two crystal has about 0.1% mismatch in lattice constant. So when we slightly twist them, then this will produce a Mori pattern. You can see from this illustration here. So once they, they form uh, the Mori pattern, then there are two effects. One is you need to consider the band alignment. Uh, for, this is the band structure uh, near the band gap for WSE2. This is the, the band for the MOSE2. Uh, they, are, they, are they are misaligned from each other. So then this will produce different kinds of excitons. For example, you have the intralayer exciton, like electron and hole are confined in one layer, but you can also have interlayer exciton, like electron in one layer, a hole in another layer. So for interlayer exciton, they will have high population and, and emit uh, photoluminescence, but for intralayer exciton, uh, they will have low population, but they will have a relatively strong oscillator strength. So we can use absorption to prop the intralayer and use emission to prop the interlayer exciton. So for example, this is the photoluminescence uh, for this heterostructure. You can see there's a, there's a strong peak in low energy. This is the interlayer exciton, uh, it's very strong. And then this is the spectrum for individual layers. Uh, like we only measure one monolayer. Then these are the, the monolayer intralayer exciton uh, for MOSE2, WSE2. But once they couple together, this intralayer exciton is quenched. You don't, you see very, very weak PL, almost unnoticeable in our data. And because all the population go to the interlayer exciton, so you have a strong peak here. And then we have measured the interlayer exciton as a, a different uh, gate voltage. So this is the interlayer exciton, uh, basically is this peak here. We're just zooming to measure this peak. And then we, we inject electron, then we find that it, it subsides. And then there are two, there are two trions, interlayer trions appear. And then in the whole side, we also see two interlayer trion features. I mean, we don't know the exact uh, ca characteristic, like exact configuration yet. We just name them as one and two trion emission features. And when we lower the laser power, so this is taken with a 20 micron, a 20 microwatt excitation laser power. Then when we lower the excitation laser power for 1000 times, we, we find that this peak uh, become a discrete. You see some fine lines here. And then the same for this trion features, they, 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 they show some sharp features, very sharp features. 
and some irregular patterns. So this is due to the localization effect uh, because you, you have the Mori potential. And the Mori potential are just like some, some uh, potential wells. When you have high power, a lot of population, most of the, the excitons, they're free to move. Uh, because you feel the potential well. But when the population is, is small, then uh, the, most of the excitons will be confined, will be trapped in a well. When they're trapped in a well, then, then they, they will emit sharper lines. Uh, so, so this is the confinement effect. And, and in our sample, we estimate that the Mori period is about 20 micron. Uh, so it is big enough to confine a, a trion. And then when the trion is confining a potential well here, then the emission will become sharp. That's why we see the sharp, sharp feature. And we call this kind of confined trions, we call them the Mori, Mori trions, like trions confined by Mori potential, Mori trions. And the Mori trions has some unusual characteristics which are different from conventional trions. One feature is that you, instead of seeing just one trion emission peak, you see two trion emission peaks. I mean, you can even see them in high power. And this separation is about seven milli EV. And this seven milli EV does not match the energy of any uh, zone center phonon, okay? So these two are not phonon replica. They're not phonon replica. Uh, they're actually related to the Moray, Moray band. Huh? So this is our uh, explanation. Huh? So when you have, a, for example, when you have a free electron, okay? You have a parabolic free electron band. And then you put this electron, uh, you put this electron in a more super lattice, okay? Then the more super lattice will have a periodic potential, right? So one effect of the periodic potential is you have the zone folding effect. Uh, you have to fold all this band back and then you produce this mini band. And you can also open this band gap. Uh, so this is a simple model to show that once you have a periodic potential, one band will be folded into multiple bands. And then the band separation can be quite small, huh? can be quite small. So this is a more, uh, uh, more comprehensive calculation. Huh? So we, we have a sinusoidal model potential and then we calculate the carrier mini band. Uh, this is for the whole side and then we, we flip the energy to the, to the positive side. Okay, so you can see there's a lower band, higher band. Huh? So let's assume that we have we have a trion. A trion is an exciton plus one carrier. And let's say the carrier is at the edge of the, the Fermi level. Let's say it's here. Okay, then they form a trion. Once they form a trion, because the trion uh, is, is a localized state, like, like it's a confined state. Huh? So this is no longer the eigenstate. Huh? This is the, the, the extended wave function. Huh? But once you confine it, then it is a superposition of many states. And the trion binding energy is actually larger than the separation of the mini band. So the, the wave function of, the, of this carrier is it actually cover multiple mini bands in this. So once this trion decay, uh, the trion recombine and then emit a photon and then also uh, there's a leftover, there's a, there's a carrier left behind. And then this carrier can be in different states. For example, this hole, can be in this lower state, but it can also be in the higher state. Huh? So that means when, once you have the Mori mini bands, the trion can have different final state to decay. When it decay, it can be in the lower state. It can, the, the left carrier, the left behind carrier can be in higher state. So that will give you multiple emission line huh? because you have different decay channel. So we have uh, simulated. So this is the simulated emission spectrum of the, of the trion. Uh, the one axis here is different Moray period, a different twist angle. So you can see that we see a strong emission peak. Uh, this is the emission when the, when the left behind carrier is, is at the lowest band. And then there's a higher uh, emission peak here. This is when the emission, when the left, left behind carrier is in the higher band. And then you also have, have some higher, higher band here. Actually this separation in our model is about seven milli EV. Uh, that, that actually matches matches our experiment. So that means this multiple band, they, they come from the effect of the Mori super lattice. Huh. 
And then uh, uh, we, we also study other kind of heterostructure, structure, uh, other kind of heterostructure. structure. Also one example is WS2 and WSE2. Um, so for this heterostructure, structure, the lattice match is much larger, is about 4%. The, 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 the advantage of uh, this system is that when the lattice mismatch is large, the twist angle does not matter too much. So, so the Moray period is more stable. Like you can make multiple samples, they will have similar Moray period. But for the, for the previous uh, heterostructure, structure, when the lattice match is very small, then the Moray period, uh, the Moray period can change a lot when you change the twist angle. So for this, for this uh, uh, heterostructure, WS to WSC to heterostructure. We also measure the reflecting contrast. Uh, this is the reflecting contrast for the intralayer uh, uh, exciton. So this is the normal one, uh, the normal exciton. Then we also see two extra ex exciton peak. This is the more exciton. Then, that means those are due to the band folding. Like you have an exciton band. Then when the exciton is in a more period, is in a more a super lattice, then the exciton band will be folded back. Like you have multiple exciton mini band, and this will give you additional features. I mean, this has been reported by other groups, so it's, it's not, not the new thing that here. The new thing here is that when we, up, when we inject the carriers into the system, we see some fine features. For example, in, in a filling factor one, filling factor two, that means you, you, uh, you feel the, uh, you feel each Mori cell with one electron, with, you feel each Mori cell with two electrons, then you see there are some modulations. Like when you feel all the Mori cells with one electron, the system has some change in the property. When you feel all the Mori cells with two electrons, then it will also change the system. This is more reasonable because this state corresponds to the mod insulator. Right? But the interesting thing is that even a fractional filling, one third and two thirds, we also see some changes. So let's zoom in into this and then we do a second derivative. Then you'll see that at one third and two thirds, you see some changes. When we calculate the conductivity, we also see one third and two third filling. So if we, if we draw the line here to, to check the conductivity, then you'll see some peaks or some dips in the conductivity at the fractional filling factor. And this shows that even a fractional filling the system can have some emergent uh, phenomena. And, and these are the, 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 the correlated states. So they actually correspond to different uh, crystalline phases of the electrons. So when the filling factor is, is one, okay, th this is the Moray pattern. When all the Moray cells are filled with one single electron, then they will form a correlated state. Uh, that is the mod insulator. Uh, but when you have one, two thirds of them, because the electron, they repel each other. Uh, for 2D system, the electron-electron interaction is strong. When they repel each other, and when the temperature is low, they want to reduce the energy. Uh, so one way to reduce the energy is to form a periodic structure, form an order state to reduce the interaction energy. And for the two-thirds state, they will form this uh, a honeycomb uh, electronic lattice. And then when you have one-third, then they will form this uh, triangular lattice. Uh, triangular lattice. So this is what we call the generalized wind crystal. Uh, we know that for 2D system, when the electrons interact strongly and repel each other, they, will, they can form a solid state, like a solid state, electron solid, we call a wind crystal. And, and it's relatively difficult to realize this system, the wind crystal, uh, because the electron, they have, they have kinetic energy, they can move away. But if you have some uh, confinement effect due to the Mori super lattice, uh, the, the Mori super lattice will, will slow down the electron. Uh, so the electron kinetic energy is suppressed. And then the interaction is strong. So this will help them to form the wind crystal. And we call this a wind crystal under the assistance of Mori pattern. We call them the generalized wind crystal. And actually, more, more of this kind of uh, generalized wind crystal can be formed. Uh, so this is a, a PL map of the interlayer trions and excitons at different uh, gate voltage. So uh, you can see a lot of fine features when you feel the electrons. So this is the integrated uh, PL intensity at different uh, gate voltage. So we mark the filling factor here. So you can see a lot of filling factor, like one third, two third, two fifth, seven fifth, uh, 
uh, like a lot of these feeling factors. Uh, if you zoom in into this uh, electron side, you can you can see some fine features. As some feeling factor, you see there's some subtle changes of the spectrum and intensity. Uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, fractional features here. So what do they correspond to? Uh, so they actually correspond to different kind of generalized uh, uh, like winner crystal and stripe state. Like for one, one half feeling factor, then the electrons, they will tend to form uh, stripe faces. Uh, they will form a, like a, some, some stripes. Uh, then when they are two fifth, they will form a, a, a different kind of a, a crystal line. So here, the, the orange dot represent a, 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 a Moray cell that is filled with one electron. The silver, the silver dot represent an empty, empty uh, Moray cell. Uh, so you can see when it is two fifth filling, then they will form an ordered state. Uh, like this is one example. Uh, uh, so this is the one third and two third. I mean, for two third, you just change the empty cell into the fuel cell and change the fuel cell into the empty cell. Then they will form, they will form a, 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 the crystalline stage with different uh, filling factor. And then for one fourth, for one seventh, uh, I think in, in, uh, in the previous colloquium given by Yong Tao, he, he uh, also mentioned, uh, also talk about this uh, generalized winner crystals. I mean, he used a different method to probe them. And here we use the optical method to probe them. And this result has been uh, published in a recent PIL paper. So in conclusion, uh, we have uh, studied uh, interesting excitonic states in uh, 2D material and heterostructure and Moray super lattices. We find that Moray WSE2 can, they can hold uh, ribbed excitons from 1S to 4S states. They also hold interesting dark excitonic states, dark excitons, dark trions with different optical selection rules, different G factors, uh, much longer lifetime. And then for bilayer WSC2, uh, they can hold an uh, interlayer exciton, like with the interlayer electric uh, dipole. So we can use the electric field to switch the energy order. Uh, so they, I mean, they're not come absolutely uh, interlayer, like partially interlayer excitons. Okay. And then for more super lattice, uh, they can confine the excitons, confine the trions. This can lead to sharp emission lines. And they can also allow multiple decay channels so that you have a different emission band from the, from the Mori trions. And then the Mori super lattices can help the electrons to form correlated states. As some fractional fillings, they can form generalized winter crystals, they can form stride phases. So this shows that 2D system is a very uh, interesting platform for us to study correlated states. And finally, uh, I would like to acknowledge my, uh, my postdoc. Uh, he's responsible for most of the work. And my student, Jeremiah, he helped me to set up the lab in uh, UC Riverside. And he's, he, he's now graduated. Uh, so uh, he's a very good helper for, to help me to construct the lab in UC Riverside. And we have a very, a very capable uh, theories in Taiwan to help us to simulate the data. And Michelle Altairi is the student who did the bilayer uh, exciton work. Uh, and then we have Matthew, Matthew and Ao and Tian Yi. Uh, they are my other students. Uh, and then uh, I want to thank my collaborator at UCR, uh, Nathan and Yong Tao, uh, and my, my advisor and also a, a collaborator, Tony, Tony Hines, and uh, her student Alice. And then uh, Zheng Guang and Dimitri, uh, our, our collaborator and helper in the National High Magnetic Field Lab. And then uh, Ta Ta Takashi and Kenji in uh, Japan, they provided us with a high quality boron nitride crystal for us to make the devices. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, do you have any questions? Thanks, Joshua. Yeah. Uh, got, anyone got a question? Yeah, actually I do. Okay, so the electronic crystals that you show the different film fractions. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. How do you know 
that this is the arrangement? Is it theoretical prediction or do you have a way to measure the actual periodicity? Uh, I mean, by the time of our work, I mean, these are just, you can say speculation, uh, but, but I mean, also supported by simulation. And then uh, recently there's a paper in Nature that uh, there's a group, uh, Fang Wang and uh, Chromius group in Ber UC Berkeley, they use STM to image the Maury super lattice. They can actually visualize some of the fractional states. They did not see all of them, but they see the one half and one third and two third. They, they, do, they do see directly that these are the patterns. Okay. And now, can you measure compressibility? Of the electronic, you know, the studio didn't the do these measurements. Huh? I mean, my group did not measure the compressibility, but it is possible to measure it. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? No other questions? Yeah, any, any questions? Uh, Joshua, can you talk about, um, so you, you showed in the, the, the Wigner crystals, they, uh, are there domain boundaries and what do they look like? And, or, or, or is it better because it's a moiré pattern? Uh, This crystal, uh, sorry. Okay, I, yeah, in any in any of those, you know, there's there's. Uh, let's say that uh, you know, have something like that. What is it really? You know, like that, or is it full of green boundaries and and uh, twisted? Oh, I'm I'm sure uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, defect and green boundaries. I'm I'm sure because generally the the sample homogeneity is not good. Like this, the, I mean, our group is still uh, struggling on how to improve the sample quality. Uh, because when you stack two, two, two 2D materials together, there are a lot of factors that can affect their coupling. Like the, they, they can have strain, the different, they, they can have something trapped in between, like some, some dirt trapped in between, they can have bubbles. A, a lot of factors that can affect the interlayer coupling. Okay, so and then one of the things that seemed intriguing to me so was you the, 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 the stripe. Does that give you some interesting conductivity in one dimension? Uh, uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, they are all insulating. Oh, it's all insulating. Okay. They're all correlated state that uh, crystalline phase, they're insulating. I see. So you don't get like super conductivity along the horizontal direction or something. They can they can probe the the dielectric property more directly. They can show that these are these are the insulating states. Mm. Okay. Uh, I mean, actually, our our result here, you, you can use the insulating state to explain it because when when they are then they are correlated, then I mean they're like a solid state, right? Solid electronic state, right? So they're no longer mobile. So so the the Screening and then, and then you when the when the screening effect is different, then the binding energy, the oscillator string of the exciton will, will change. That's why we see the spectral features here. Okay, and then uh, one of the uh, interests in the dark excitons and trions was their longer lifetime, which might yes. be able to be harnessed in some kind of electronics. Uh, it, it, could you comment about that? Uh, so the lifetime is certainly very important if you want to realize any kind of try and transport. Um, so the, let me see. 
the I mean here I list the factor. Huh. The electric field. Mobility, whether it is possible to realize try and transport. And for electric field, uh, there's not much you can do with it. I mean, you can you can only apply this much electric field. But mobility, you can certainly improve. Uh, you, when you make the sample cleaner, better, the mobility can improve by a factor of two or three, or maybe even 10. Uh, but still the range is limited. But lifetime is something that we can work on because for dark triad and, and bright triad, the lifetime can be two orders of magnitude difference. And that makes a big difference. And for us, this dark trion, when we really measure, is actually not that dark. Uh, the main reason is because it is in the lowest energy state. It can accumulate a large population. So that compensates for the, for the small oscillator strength. We can actually, uh, we can actually uh, see the PL without any problem. So I would say this, all this combination make that dark trion transport something interesting to, 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 to do. And, and for this kind of dark content, so you, if things goes well, you can actually see how the dark are distributed because they emit light. So this is something interesting. You can, you can study the transport in a visual, visualizing way. Uh, another thing uh, we can realize is that this uh, very high effect, but because they have the very degree of freedom, transport those valleys they have very curvature okay so so different valleys they will have they will gain some uh, lateral uh, lateral uh, uh, motion so so like the whole effect like like one kind of carry will go up the other will go down so you you can actually you can expect to have the to try a very high effect like this has some something that uh, like we can possibly learn in this kind of transport setup but I would say for practical application, we, there's still a long way to go. There's still a long way to go. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions? Don't hear any. So thanks again, Joshua. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll stop my sharing here. Okay.